starting to quiet down. Thanks, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. I'm Deb McIndefer, Director of Entity Monitoring, and I'm um, happy to be the MC for this panel. So as Melanie stated in her opening comments, risk analysis is included in everything we do. As such, the upcoming panel led by Sandra Revnall, the entity mon one of my entity monitoring managers, is going to discuss how risk influences the monitoring types, the frequency and the scopes of our monitoring activities. And the panel consisting of Fahad Ansari, a senior technical advisor from the oversight planning group, Caleb Bremhall, an enforcement attorney, and Renee Knarborg and Josh Rowe, both senior auditors, will discuss how the oversight teams collaborate on how the risk categories and monitoring objectives um, are, are determined, as well as how your internal programs can affect those scopes. So please help me in welcoming the panel. Thanks for that, Deb. Um, as Deb mentioned, my name is Sandra Ravnell. I am an entity monitoring manager, um, and I'm going to be moderating with this panel today. Um, let me forward here. Okay, so uh, the intent or the objective of this presentation is to learn about the inputs to an entity's monitoring scope. And you'll note that I'm saying monitoring and not audit scope because there are various tools that we utilize for monitoring, and, and those are included with that. Um, what we're looking to do is understand how different types or different CMEP teams within WEC collaborate to develop that monitoring scope, um, how established and emerging risks can dictate the frequency and type of monitoring within, within the Western interconnect, and then knowledge of an entity's internal controls, their management of residual risk, um, how that can all impact a monitoring scope. Um, <clears throat> One of the key items that we want to discuss today is that a COP or a compliance oversight plan is not equal to an AML. Some of you that have been um, around the arena for a while know that an AML is actively monitored standard list. Uh, we actually still see those in parts of Canada as well, um, but it's not equal to that, nor is it equal to scope. So that's, that's the premise of this discussion is let's talk about those major inputs. Uh, Deb already introduced the panel participants, so I'm going to hop right into questions here. Um, the first question I have is for Fahad. Fahad, in your role as Senior Technical Advisor for Oversight Planning, uh, share with us those major inputs. All right. Uh, how much time do we have again? <laughs> uh, so th there are two major inputs uh, of sets of information that drive the scope of a monitoring engagement. Uh, one is the entity-specific risks, such as their inherent risk or uh, residual risk, and two is the intercontinent-wide or interconnection-wide uh, risks. The ERO Enterprise developed a risk-based CMEV framework, which is on NERC website, that provides some crucial elements of planning and executing monitoring engagements. Uh, over the years, the ERO Enterprise has provided more guidance on assessing risks, uh, considering the performance of an entity to mitigate reliability and security risks. Uh, the inherent risk factors uh, that you guys are, are, are quite familiar with, uh, with the uh, inherent risk assessment, uh, such as the generation portfolio, critical transmission, uh, SIP impact rating criteria, they provide necessary details about the nature of the company. And the performance indicators such as prior monitoring, compliance, enforcement history, the performance of, uh, of the generation data, the transmission data, uh, the events analysis and internal controls, that indicates the unmitigated uh, risk. For the interconnection-wide or the, uh, the intercontinent-wide risk, uh, the oversight planning staff relies on the CMEP implementation plan, the, non, uh, the annual CMEP implementation plan that NERC puts out, uh, the regional risk assessment, 
and other reports that indicate elevated risk that can cause stress to the Western interconnect. The risk engineers uh, review these two major sets of information and they apply their professional judgment to identify key targeted areas that warrants a review. Now, that, w that review can be a, in the form of a audit review or a, another type of monitoring review. Hope, hope that helps. Great, thanks Fahad. So the next question I have is for all of our panelists here. Um, all aspects of CMEP contribute to each other. Obviously, collaboration on monitoring objectives and scope are important to ensure continuity across the CMEP. How do you, in your role, interact in this scenario? And I'm actually going to start with Renee on this one. Okay, so as an auditor, um, I participate with the pre-audit uh, meetings with the risk engineer where he presents the specific risks that have been identified for the audit engagement along with the initial scope for the audit. We also review uh, the entity's response to the internal controls questionnaire. Uh, did the entity respond to the questionnaire? Were the questions complete? Was supporting documentation provided? So all of these are considered, and also as an auditor, if I've had the opportunity to uh, attend a previous audit engagement with this particular entity, I can bring back um, what was the entity's culture of compliance? Did they have a strong culture of compliance? Have they implemented effective internal controls? And all of this information then can contribute to refining the scope of the audit. Great, thanks Renee. Um, so just circling back to the question again, this is collaboration on monitoring scope, or excuse me, monitoring objectives and scope. Um, Josh, can you unbox that a little bit from your perspective? Yeah, good afternoon everybody. Um, so about six to eight months after, or before an audit engagement begins, uh, we have the opportunity to collaborate with the risk engineers to develop and finalize what the audit scope actually looks like. And so what I'll do is kind of give you a little peek behind the curtain of what this looks like. Uh, so the risk engineer sits down with us and we talk about the inherent risks, past performances at audit, uh, looking at the enforcement history, or giving me anything that's pertinent to understand the entity's profile. Um, for some of you, I've been the ATL mul multiple times, so I, I know a little bit about the entity. But if it's the first time that we're seeing this, I want to understand a couple of things. How were the risks identified? What considerations were there when developing this scope? What was taken into account for it? And, and what are the risks, what are the objectives the risk engineers want the auditors to achieve during the audit? So if you think about it from an ATL perspective, we're here to give you a value added audit, but what do we get back in return? I need to, I need to deliver something back to my customer, which is the risk engineer, or on those un unfortunate circumstances, an enforcement engineer. I need to understand what objectives they want me to achieve. And then next, what information do you need from the audit team? When I write these work papers up, I can simply say compliant or non-compliant, what do you want from me so it can better suit the inherent risk assessment or shape that compliance oversight plan for a future monitoring strategy that's specific to that entity? Great, thank you, Josh. Uh, Caleb, I'm really interested to hear your perspective on this from enforcement. And as, as WEC strives to improve the way in which we look at risk and to, to focus, ri focus on risk, enforcement also uses and shares um, information. We're working on ways to improve that so that information can be shared and used as we look at monitoring activities. Uh, for example, enforcement uses a lot of information as well, compliance oversight plans, um, and lots of uh, the information that comes from entities as we look at individual instances of non-compliance. Uh, enforcement also has a lot of information that we collect and share and are, are working on better ways to share that. But risk as it relates to specific non-compliances, um, the inputs to evaluating risk tells WEC a lot about a registered entity's compliance culture, program, and controls that the entity has in place regarding specific non-compliances, related standards, and then the registered entities compliance program generally. So for example, is an entity willing to proactively ensure that extent of condition, causal factors, 
and remediation is comprehensive. Uh, one of the biggest indicators of a strong compliance program, and we can see it as we look at the mitigating activities and what's going on, is our NERC compliance activities incorporated into daily job functions of the entities responsible subject matter experts or is or, or NERC compliance activities an afterthought. Another thing that we look at or that we share is, and, and I think it's somewhat counterintuitive at times, is number of enforcement actions. And I think, it, so the number of, of non-compliances is not necessarily a negative, but rather may show a robust program um, with great preventative, detective, and corrective controls where the issues are being found quickly, corrected, uh, remediated and prevented in the future, which greatly enhances the reliability of the grid. And this is why WEC is so inter interested in expanding the self-logging program, because lots lots of entities, almost everyone that I've worked with since being here at WEC, have really robust programs. They're doing really great things. And because of the, the focus, because they're focusing on the why and doing great things, we want those entities to reap those benefits. You're, you're looking at your programs and doing great things, and uh, that's what self-logging gives us the opportunity to do is uh, get, to some degree turn the reins over to you and let you do the things that you're doing so well. Um, the One other thing that's very helpful in is helping share the information and gather information is WEX now assigning specific engineers and attorneys to in specific entities. So. Unfortunately, those that get assigned to me, you have to put up with me for a long, long time. So we get an opportunity to get to know you a little bit more. We get to work with you, and uh, that really helps us uh, work together to address risks and then to share information internally on how programs are going, how um, mit mitigation uh, and those things are going on. So those are some ways that we gather information and then strive to share it internally so that the oversight uh, goes well and is focused on the things that really matter. And I apologize for my voice. You're fine. And and you are not a problem at all to put up with. I enjoy working with you. <laughs> um, Fahad, is there anything that you'd like to add on that internal cl collaboration piece? Yeah, sure. Uh, so in addition to the to, to enforcement staff and the entity monitoring staff, uh, the risk engineers or the oversight planning team, they also coordinate with other uh, teams at VEC, uh, for example, the registration and certification team, the uh, the RAPA group, or, and uh, as uh, uh, discussed earlier, the centralized risk group, uh, to get uh, to get some more information uh, that that can really indicate on on where the 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 targeted risks lie that warrant a review. Uh, for example, a new SCADA EMS upgrade uh, or an upgrade to an existing one. Can can impact an entity's engagement scope, and the sooner we get to that information, the more efficiently we can plan for uh, for the for the engagements. So, as you can see, with with, with the collaboration, uh, the the compliance oversight plan does not equal to AML, and and that does not indicate that that is your scope. The 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 COP is is, is a snapshot in time that consist of logical grouping of risks and their corresponding uh, reliability standards. It's meant to highlight the highest priority risks that appears to be unmitigated or it appears to be struggling to mitigate the risk that they, that, that, that they should. The Appendix B of the Compliance Oversight Plan report does fairly a good job in highlighting the requirements that can be prioritized by both the entity and the uh, and the and the VEC team for monitoring, uh, but that list is not meant to be an AML or an audit scope, as the landscape of risk could could evolve in a short period of time, and and and, and the new technologies can be installed in a very quick fashion. Great, thanks, Fahad. Okay, I actually think this segues really well into the next question that I just so happen to have for you. Um, with a risk-based approach, there has been a fundamental shift from schedule-based emphasis as a driver of activities. Uh, Fahad, what tools and information are we using today to better understand and address emerging risks? And how is WEC looking to reconsider and simplify processes and timing in the future? So some of this is um, forward-looking, some of this is today. Okay, yeah, 
so uh, as uh, as we have heard in the in the opening remarks that it, it's it's about reliability and security right and not just compliance and enforcement uh the there is an intentional effort to identify and prioritize known unmitigated and emerging risks throughout the interconnection uh there are several teams at WAC uh, that are involved with this effort and uh, within the CMEP group uh, the staff is working towards utilizing these various studies and assessments that are put forth by various groups, uh, such as the regional risk assessment, summer reliability report, or winter reliability report, long-term reliability report. All these reports, they, they, they have one thing in common, that they address risk that they see on horizon. So the idea is that the in addition to these risks that are highlighted in conjunction with the registered entities participation in in various programs like midas gads tads uh teams for events analysis they they all provide really valuable information to uh, understand to better understand the known and emerging risks uh vec will continue to schedule audits as for the for the RC, BA, and TOP registered entities every three years. That's that's a mandatory form of audit. As for the rules of procedures, we are we, we are bound by it and we'll continue to do that. But but the idea is to make sure that the risks are addressed and we provide adequate monitoring activities to get as much coverage as we can. So the, the, there are various tools that REC is looking into, into leveraging uh, these oversight activities. The, there have been assurance visits in the past. Uh, uh, the, the, the panels and, uh, and speakers earlier mentioned about various uh, outreach activities, how we can engage better with the industry. So we are looking into that. As these programs and timelines mature, we can we, we can set up some separate uh, open mic or you know follow up at our fall workshop with as to what we have learned and and how we can better utilize these uh, these tools in future wonderful thanks fahad that's really helpful information um for this next question i'm going to let you take a breath <laughs> and uh, we'll work with renee josh and caleb um so wax seeks to deliver the value proposition of risk-based cmp cmep to registered entities and with that internal controls is part of the work not added to it uh, renee josh and caleb let's talk about that a little bit this time i'd like to start with caleb awesome controls <clears throat> Who loves controls? We talk about controls all the time. I love controls. So my family sometimes hates how much I love controls. But um, controls, it's any action taken to manage risk and increase the likelihood that we'll reach our goal, that we'll, we'll get our desired outcome. And in our case, it's our mission, all of us here, which is to reduce the risk to the reliability and security of the bulk power system. And we got lots of people relying on us. So just to start out with a couple of simple examples uh, of controls that we may have done today. So how many of you made sure your hotel room was locked before you left? Raise your hand, please. Okay. How many of you locked your car today if you left it? Okay. I think I locked mine. I was running towards the, I, I may have missed a control. It's sitting at a uh, front runner station and somebody may have taken it. Um, how many of you have a debit card? Raise your hand. Okay, watch, watch your purses, I'll be taking them later. So <laughs> how do we protect our debit cards? What are some things that we do? So we make sure no one's looking when we type it in. My wife laughs at me the way that I, I kind of move around and type in my pin so nobody can see it. Often the keypads have some, some things on them to prevent people from seeing it easily. And then the bank tells you don't ever write it down and put it together. Um, and you know, we all have those great aunts or grandmas that write it down, stick it together, and put it in their purse. But those, so those are some simple, some simple controls, some controls that we that we use in our daily uh, lives. So in the electric utility business, internal controls focused on reliability and security that are incorporated into those daily daily job functions and tasks reduce the risk. And so it's it's really important to all that we do in enforcement. We spend a lot of time talking about internal controls. 
Um, so, because, and we're going to talk a little bit about this in this next session, but barring very rare extenuating circumstances or rarely seen egregious behavior, risk is the primary driver for what we do in enforcement. It's going to determine the disposition method, it's going to determine the penalty. And so, controls have a lot to do about that. And so, we want to know all the amazing things that entities are doing and all the controls that you have in place. And often, we find more often, more often than not, we find that. Entities have a whole lot more controls in place than they initially tell us. And so we get to have that conversation and dig in last week. In fact, I had a conversation with an entity and it was great because it was it was apparent that the, the mitigation had been effective. It had prevented reoccurrence, but we didn't know how it was being prevented. And so we had a conversation. It was about a 45 minute conversation about, OK, how are you preventing it? It's clear that you've you've prevented this from reoccurring. And as we got into it, we found some additional internal controls that haven't hadn't been shared with us. And once those were shared with us, we knew why it had been prevented. So one of the things and we talked a little bit about this in, in enforcement fundamentals training. And if you haven't taken that, we'd love you to take it. Um, and we talk about how do we go through and get all the information we need and then and resolve the cases. But there's there's some critical places within there. In addition to the risk that we use those internal controls, one is in the extent of condition. And so as we look at it and an extent of condition, we're trying to figure out the whole picture. Internal controls have play a huge part there. They can bound really the extent of condition, how much work you have to do to figure out whether or not there's additional instances of noncompliance. So there's one place we use it. Root cause, again, uh, if you've got controls in place, we, we can look and determine and find out what the root cause is. And those, those controls, again, bound the, the the large picture that we're looking at trying to find out okay what is the actual root cause and what you've got in place and then of course those are we implement additional controls to go ahead and shore up any outstanding root cause that's there so essentially with the internal controls um, hopefully it doesn't become a word that we just keep that we're just repeating but rather it's something that we talk about frequently and we use it it just in, in the enforcement realm, those are the, some of the ways that we use it, um, but it's really important. And it's essentially the way that you do business. One of the things that I'll just, and I'll, I'm gonna close my thoughts with this, is the, sometimes it, it, we, we tend to have the conversation that somehow you've gotta have this huge program of internal controls. And so you have to be a big entity to be able to have a good internal controls program. And having worked for um, several small entities, um, we want to get get away from that. You don't have to have a specialized computer program to make it happen, but rather you can incorporate it in, into the daily job functions, the computer maintenance management systems that your entities are already using, that your technicians are using out at the power plants or to do work on the transmission lines. And so it, it can be a, really implemented everywhere in, in the systems that are already being used by those that do the work. Great, thanks Caleb. Uh, so just briefly revisiting the question again, this, this value add to entities with risk-based approach and internal controls not being a bolt-on. Josh, can you talk about it a little bit? I'm probably going to get a little long-winded, so <laughs> see how this goes. Uh, so keeping on the theme of my job as an auditor, keeping that curtain kind of peeled back a little bit, uh, it's to provide the value-added work papers to the risk engineers. And in that unfortunate circumstance uh, of a potential non-compliance or an issue that's there, uh, just to provide them with the information that's needed to develop a comprehensive uh, compliance oversight plan that is risk-based uh, and it's used for a future strategy uh, for a different monitoring engagement. And so there's a statement I made a couple of weeks ago in a, in a call with an entity where I said compliance and controls are synonymous. And, and that person at the entity was bold enough to stand up and say, no, they're not. And so I took that back and I, I revisited my thought process to it. And so I want, I want to rephrase it where compliance and controls are often used synonymously. So for in an audit context, compliance and controls represent two distinct parts of a successful process. Controls are designed to accomplish a goal while compliance is the execution of the process that was designed. And so from an auditor's perspective, it requires a two lens approach. One, did the entity demonstrate compliance with the regulatory requirements? Two, does the entity have controls in place to maintain compliance with the regulatory requirements? 
And so demonstrating compliance with regulatory requirements, that's, that's a tongue twister. Uh, demonstrating compliance with regulatory requirements is like taking a picture. It's a snapshot in time, if you will. It shows us what occurred at a specific point, but it doesn't give us a look into the future. So we leverage a variety of tools, ranging from the responses in your internal controls data collection template, as well as your compliance narratives to identify how entities have developed internal controls to ensure consistent implementation. Uh, this is really a bigger thing to look at how are we implementing risk reduction strategies and how are we taking that strategy that you've developed and showed us and give it back to our customers and the, at the risk team. So real quick, just to circle back to that initial statement about providing value added work papers. If you ever noticed the little purple boxes in an RSAW, uh, it's titled compliance assessment approach. Uh, these are the questions that the auditors have to answer. And so we like to make sure that that says no finding, uh, but there are a couple other ones that you can have, uh, potential non-compliance or not applicable. When we answer those questions, the work papers go back to our risk engineers. That's, that's my customer. And so I can give them a simple yes. They are compliant and that is it. Uh, but what kind of snapshot is that? It's just a single picture of yes, they're compliant. A more value added statement would be the ent entity documented and implemented XYZ processes. Additionally, they developed preventative, or preventive, detective and corrective controls and list out what those controls are and give them some value added responses to say, the controls as designed are going to reduce the risk of a non-compliance or it will lead to risk reduction strategies. And so when you're thinking about this, I need to make sure that the next three years, as they're going to use this compliance oversight plan to develop what your monitoring strategy is, my input to them has to be value added. It has to identify what controls that you have in place, leveraging the tools that you have, ultimately reducing what could be that scope to a very targeted risk-based focus. So hopefully I didn't take too much time there. But. I think you did great. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Renee, I'm wondering if you can provide your perspective on this as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so I noticed that there's a number of new people, people here new to compliance. And so I'm gonna kind of roll back a little bit and speak to the basics. Um, for a lot of you that are just starting out, when you look at a standard, there's a purpose statement at the top of the standard, which really identifies what is the basic risk to the BES and is the reason why this standard was written. And then effective internal controls are basically a key indicator to us as auditors when we come in to see if an entity is serious about developing programs and processes that address the risk identified, um, not just in the standard, but also in your COP, and ensure that you can maintain ongoing compliance. So when we're looking at internal controls, there should be some effective processes, perhaps including automated systems or specific tools that are going to address things like change management, work management, and probably most importantly, document management. Um, often entities are already doing many of these things. And some examples of internal controls that we see at audits include automated alert systems that have uh, for reminders for time sensitive um, tasks that need to be completed. Do they have escalations that will go to a backup subject matter expert or to a manager, supervisor. Quality controls can help to ensure accuracy and completion of task. And so we're looking at, do you, have you implemented peer reviews? Do you have effective training and tracking? Is your documentation consistent? Do you have identified review cycles and approvals and signatures? And so at audits, you will see us as auditors have internal controls um, interviews. And again, this allows us to get the big picture about what you may already be doing to ensure compliance and to mitigate risk. 
And it allows us to bring these unidentified, perhaps unidentified internal controls to the surface. And then we will bring those controls also back to the risk team and it will be considered as input for the next audit engagement as it comes along. And so it, it all works in a cycle. Wonderful. Thanks, Renee. Oh, Fahad. We could talk about this all afternoon, I think, but let's talk about differentiated audit approach. And a couple of the items that I really want to hit on are scope size and similar scopes amongst entities. Yeah, so I, th I think we have we have some time. So le le let me let me tell uh, a quick scenario that it, that that I came up with uh, this morning. Uh, so I I come from Atlanta or as some people call it, Hotlanta. And I am, and I arrived yesterday and I'm still adjusting to the Utah weather. And after entering this building, I thought that state of Utah should declare an, a requirement for an ambient indoor temperature <laughs> because I'm still adjusting. And uh, so with, with that hypothetical requirement that state of Utah has, that the indoor ambient temperature should always be and shall remain 72 degrees Fahrenheit forever. Uh, we, we, we need to have some controls in place to maintain compliance to that requirement. Now, as we all know that controls are expensive. It, there is no, we can't deny that, that they, they come with a cost. So people and companies mileage vary. Uh, and uh, some company can can have a furnace to maintain that kind of a weather, uh, and and some companies can, but but to keep people not to get frostbite indoors, they they can provide some thick uh, sweatshirts, they can provide woolen socks, they can have a pantry with hot soup so that people are fine. And, and those are the measures that company has taken to mitigate the risk of frostbite for their valued employees, right? Now, these are all measures that, they, that the company took to mitigate a risk. And by the way, to also be compliant with ambient indoor temperature, mm -hmm. right? So the, the idea is, the more we know that you have got sweatshirts and woolen socks and soups in your cafeteria, the better we can plan and prepare to target the areas that we need to deep dive into. So we know that if you have all these measures in place, we only look at your thermostat readings once in a while. We trust you that you are not you know, freezing your employees, but but once in a while we have to come there and check the thermostat by ourselves, but that's the only extent. That's how we gain efficiency. That's how we attain uh, uh, efficiency in conducting our monitoring engagement. Uh, Jamie earlier uh, mentioned that w during the standard drafting team, as they're going through these several projects, they want to make sure that the standards address the when, what, and who. Who is gonna do what measures by when? How is largely flexible on the entities because your mileage might vary? And, and that's what we want to account when we want to provide the differentiated audit experience. We want to meet those audit objectives but we want to meet those efficiently. There are various informations collected by the risk engineers during audit planning that talks about the characteristics of your company. And, and we can utilize these information that the measures that you have in place to direct our resources where to deep dive, which facilities to look for, which elements to consider for sampling, which assets to consider for sampling, to identify potential gaps and provide feedback. The idea is to provide feedback and, and also and so that 
the compliance just become like a byproduct of that engagement with that entity. Does does that help or have I no, made no. people more hungry talking about soup? I, well, I'm looking for a scarf, but I'm, I'm good. Um, so it's quite possible that risk areas and scope and of an engagement can be the same um, amongst similarly registered or neighboring entities. And I'm hoping that you can elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, so it, it goes back to the same who, what, and when, right? Those are there, but, but it is really interested in, in understanding, obtaining an understanding on how the companies have employed their people, process, and procedures can really impact how the even the similarly scoped engagements can vary in experience. Because you might not like woolen socks. Am I taking this too far now? <laughs> I should stop. I love a good analogy. Okay, so thank you for the information about how we gain reasonable assurance and what that might look like and what it might not. Um, so what I'd like to do just with closing is I, I think that we've demonstrated today there are a lot of major inputs to an entity's monitoring scope. Um, you know, there are various parts of our CMEP, the teams within WAC that collaborate to de develop that monitoring scope. And then, you know, established and emerging risks, they really do dictate a lot when we talk about frequency um, and monitoring within the Western Interconnect. So having an knowledge of an entity's in controls, their management, management of residual risk can impact monitoring scope and certainly wool socks matter. So um, again, one of the points that we really want to have an opportunity to drive home is that a COP is not equal to an AML and nor is it equal to scope. So it's not just about getting through an audit, it's about the investment in your program um, and your reliability and security posture that come with that. Um, what we are doing is trying to best understand where an entity is going above and beyond and really capture that accordingly in the snapshot. And I think that both Renee and Josh did a great job of speaking to that. Um, and also that you as the entity, you're part of that mindset and experience when we move forward. Um, I think that we have some time for questions. Hello, this is Monica Kaiso. Um, so nice to see you guys in person, see your beautiful faces. I know a lot of times we work uh, remotely together. Thank you so much for this presentation. I think it was really informational for folks that are new to compliance as well as for some seasoned folks. You brought up some really interesting topics such as differentiate audit. Uh, how you look at risk-based information that you can that you collaborate on uh, with the other WEC, WEC teams. And that's actually where my question is. Um, I'm not sure who had uh, actually uh, talked about this earlier, but can you give us a little bit more information on how you guys collaborate with like the risk engineers and the other uh, WEC uh, team members in regards to getting the information that you need or internal controls as you look at enforcement, as you process dispositions, as you, you know, determine kind of the next steps with uh, measures and mitigations for any self reports or self logs entities uh, submit you. All right, I, I can take that. Um, so the process starts right after WEC sends out 270 day in letter for intent to engage with the entity. Uh, that's when the risk engineers, they, 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 they start off by just researching about the entity, uh, going through the inherent risks, uh, going through the unmitigated or residual risk as identified in your compliance oversight plan. Uh, they go through all of that and then they make an intentional effort to coordinate with different teams at VAC. So if there are already some P, uh, some PNCs, or if there has been some recent submission of self-report, there is a pending open enforcement action. Uh, it's, it's, it's their responsibility that they get in contact with the appropriate mitigation engineer, uh, get information on it. Uh, they, they collaborate with the prior entity monitoring staff uh, and, and gain information on and what was the past audit experience like. Uh, they collaborate with, uh, with a RAPA group and, uh, and centralized risk group to understand 
what are some of the known and emerging risk in that BA footprint where that entity lies? Maybe there is a transmission choke point. Maybe there is uh, there are some new IBR uh, that are coming up that, are, that that fall under no trip zone. How th these are just indication of risk, and then they apply various professional judgment to prioritize risk for that engagement. And then, but how how does enforcement take advantage of that uh, information and then apply it to their processing of the self reports and self logs? Hey, Monica. Hi, Kellen. <laughs> the uh, so we will, as I mentioned earlier, this is this is something that's in process that we're trying to find better ways to gra gather the information that's being collected elsewhere and make sure we're using it. So currently probably the place that we pull it the most out of is the compliance oversight plan. So that's where we grab information about internal controls and we can use that. But um, often at, we're having to ask uh, about that information. And some of the controls are gonna be very specific to the individual instances of non-compliance. And so we do look at the compliance oversight plans and internally we're having this discussion. That's one of the reasons we had this panel. And as we were preparing, we were discussing, well, how can we better do this? And so we're we're working on trying to find ways to make sure that all the information we're gathering is shared amongst all of us. And right now it's a work in progress. Uh, but um, the compliance oversight plan is probably the place that we look the most. And then for individual specific instances of non-compliance, we're really relying on the entities to give us some additional detail and welcome all the input that you can give. Give us everything that might be related so that we can correctly assess risk and understand what's going on there. Thank you. Yeah, I just think that there is a lot of data that you guys already have, and there's a huge opportunity for you guys to uh, take a look at it, collect it, you know, leverage it. And of course, you know, we're all very willing to provide you anything else that you need. And I just wanted to also say a big thank you because uh, we've had a great experience working with you guys uh, through a differentiated audit as well as through our enforcement processes. So, you know, you guys are doing a great job and um, hoping that you guys will continue to improve this process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. <laughs> Thank you guys again. Uh, Rome Gabi from San Diego Gas and Electric. It's, I, I don't know if anyone else is sensing the elephant. Um, it's cold in here. Uh, Fahad, you, maybe we can get some sweaters and you know things and so forth. But. I guess the, the elephant in, in essence in the room is would an entity be able to come back to WEC and say, hey, look, what was your snapshot? What did it look like? What were those elements that you said audit scope is X or enforcement action activity is Y? I mean, is there a snapshot that you can go back to, say, your working papers to say these were the elements that were considered to come up with this assessment? And I mean, it's a this is great to hear the collaboration that goes on within WEC and we're all, you know, the the, uh, the fig leaves are kind of provided over to one another, but where, where and when and maybe how can an entity kind of come into your brain and say, yeah, I agree with you or, hey, you didn't quite get this right. So that's the elephant in the room, I think, that some folks may be thinking about. I'll start, but, but you can Follow, follow up on that. Uh, I, I do want to clarify one thing before we move into this, though. Are you talking about the assessment in terms of what ends up in a monitoring scope? That would probably be the easiest one. Okay. Um, but I mean, any action that you're taking, if there's this collaboration that, that's going on and there's a snapshot, what does that snapshot look like? And can we kind of help out or, I don't know, maybe participate <laughs> in your activity? And yes, you're the regulator and we're the entity. It's not a, it's not a, um, I guess, a confrontation, but okay. it's, it's like, okay, well, let's help one another out. You're trying to find compliance. We're trying to help you find compliance, but maybe you didn't quite look in the right place. You know, it's way out on this, uh, the extent of that branch, but you only looked to the solid place that you could actually feel safe to climb on. Go ahead, Pat. Um, uh, just a quick, uh, one of the, projects internally uh, to, to support this uh, transformation effort is to engage with the registered entity uh, outside of 
the audit parameters. So as soon as the, the letter of intent to engage goes out to the entity, uh, we are expecting that the risk engineers themselves uh, get in touch with the entity uh, and, and obtain an understanding uh, uh, with the entity, kind of have uh, COP, the last uh, compliance oversight plan uh, walk through, so to speak, with the entity to, to kind of make sure that we are all aligned in the risk prioritization, uh, that, that, that if there are certain risks that you are seeing on the grid, because ultimately, if you are a system operator, if you are operating on the grid, you would have a lot more day-to-day -day information as to what is occurring on the system and can provide feedback to us on some of the known and emerging risks. And in, in one of the uh, one of the initiatives internally is to, to make that happen. Uh, and, and that is, and we are still working on that timeline and we are still working through the the, the, the administrative and the logistics aspects of it, but, but that is the intent to, to, to have more engaging conversations with the registered entity to better understand risk. Okay. So Jerome, um, just along those lines, right? I mean, we know about this much about your, your companies and you know far more, right? And so we're really trying to engage with you up front to understand how you're addressing the risks that we've identified and, and that gain that information so we can use it to inform how we show up, when we show up, and how often we show up to, to look at those things. So hopefully that helps. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it, we, we get that elephant uh, kind of smaller and they can fit out of the room now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, Jerome, last time we did the, the call to give you your scope, I asked you a wonderful question. It was, do you want to add anything else to your audit scope <laughs> that, that we missed? And so far, nobody has taken me up on that question. So the um, offer is still open then? It is always okay. open. Okay. Um, okay. I, I, I kind of want to piggyback on something from your response here and then what Monica had said. You don't see what happens after audit. <clears throat> so when we leave, we close up shop about three, four weeks later, you get a a letter back saying this is what the results were. We ask you to review it for all of our grammatical errors, which are probably few and far. Okay, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> and then, then after that, you don't see us for a little while. And so, and so what happens after that? Well, the information isn't data dumped. Um, those working papers go over to the risk engineers and it's like hieroglyphics for them sometimes where they have to ask us for some translation. And so we have a, a post meeting with them or an after monitoring assessment meeting and we, we go through what we saw at audit. We talk through the working papers. We identify or, or respond to any of their questions of, did we miss something? Is there something else we need to look at? Where's the, the residual, residual risk? Or what do we not need to do the next time? That can be an input that goes into the compliance oversight plan. And so for those that have participated in it or, or been part of it, the, the post audit meeting that we have is another input to that compliance oversight plan. When we finish the audit, we give you your recommendations, areas of concern, and everybody's getting a positive observation. When it comes to this, we need to take that information, understand it from your perspective before we put it back into the next compliance oversight plan, or we have atrophied information. So that post audit meeting is a great opportunity for us to see what other controls have you developed. If we said your recommendations to be something simple as keep extra large sweaters in, in the cabinet and you come back post audit, that's, and you don't tell us that there's extra sweaters in there, we still think that recommendation is, is existing. There's an existing risk. But if you have minimized it by saying we have a complete wardrobe of extra large sweaters in there, we can take that information post audit, apply it as, as part of your compliance oversight plan refresh. So there's discussions that happen between us there. Uh, and the same thing on the enforcement side, if we have to pass something over to the enforcement folks, we, we make sure that we give them the information they need, provide any controls that we seen. Maybe there was a small non-compliance, but the controls were all there. We can help by providing that information to the risk engineers so they don't have to submit a ton of requests for information or, or ask you to do full extent of conditions on certain things. We have the ability to communicate back and forth. So you don't really get to see like the behind the curtain on that portion, but I think if we could be more transparent 
on how that information is used to develop the cop or how it's used to refresh in the event that something is brought to light. And that could be something we take back. And I think Kim alluded to that a, a little bit ago. And Josh, those 90 day calls are relatively new. They've been impl implemented for maybe a year. We've, we've actually almost gone through a full cycle of three years. 2021 uh, was our first program that we did that. Okay. That's great info. And Sandra, if I may, I just wanted to mention 1 thing and that is so Jerome, your. Your question sure appreciated and 1 of the things that is happening as well is that. We are being assigned two entities and the goal is to try and keep. Uh, like, for example, in enforcement, there's a OMP and engineer, a SIP engineer and an attorney that's assigned to entities. And I know that uh, in the oversight world that's happening as well. And so I think that's hopefully going to help this dialogue um, where we were partners in trying to increase the reliability and security of the grid. And so hopefully that conversation will become more natural as, as we build relationships. I, I smiled as Monica came up and asked the question because Monica said to put up with me lots. And so, but the dialogue is, it's great because when we have questions, we can, we can have those conversations and it's much more of a natural conversation where we, we really have, uh, we can get much, much further, much faster because we know each other and we're working together um, moving forward. And so I really appreciate that shift. And that's something that's happened recently. And is I've seen a huge benefit as we, we get to know and work with each other and hopefully stay assigned to each other as best we can uh, to make sure that we can have that conversation, feel comfortable doing so. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll continue with the, uh, the process of not so much Updating our wardrobe to have full sweaters and so forth. We're going to pods uh, 72 degrees all the time. Um, so maybe we can get a every 6 year audit at this point. So that's a request at this point. Go ahead. Hi, Richard with AES corporation. Uh, I'd like to ask about small utilities with regards to monitoring efforts. I'm talking about those little DPs, the geos. Really low risk it folks that have not been uh, had an active monitoring engagement for eight plus years. So they may not have a cop, or if they have a cop, it's outdated, maybe just an IRA. So these entities also, because they're very lean, don't have maybe but one compliance person. Their like internal controls probably aren't really the same level as, say, someone from San Diego Gas and Electric. And uh, so I'm curious about the transparency that may be provided to these folks. Um, you know, obviously an audit notice letter is something we we would expect to see during an audit, but before that even, is there going to be some hard deadline? Well, no entity should go more than 12 years without a monitoring effort, or should there be some sort of engagement uh, with those utilities to say, hey, how are you doing? Uh, we want you to let you know we're thinking about you. Uh, et cetera. Um, just want you to know what your thoughts are on re with regards to those folks. I certainly think moving forward into the future, those entities that are um, registered as DPs, GO, GOPs, that type of thing, there's an opportunity for outreach there. Certainly self certifications and that type of thing, they continue to go out, um, but it shouldn't. An audit notice shouldn't be the only time that we interact with an entity. So I think there, there's an opportunity to use different monitoring tools in our toolbox, if you will. And that does include outreach to better communicate, um, especially when we have an emerging risk. Um, and it's something that we, we need to address. So is there anything else that you all would like to add? Oh, sorry. Um. The entity monitoring team has um, just went through a redesign that most of you are probably aware of, but we um, do have a single a team that's a single point of contact for small entities going forward and Stacia Karen's leading that team. So, although audit is 1 tool that we have, there's also self certifications and um, we are planning a lot of outreach for the small entities going forward. Um, Stacia's just put together some great presentations that she's been giving to the Canadian entities that are going through some self certifications and, and we can see that those will be really valuable to all the small entities. So she'll be really engaged with the, the small, I have to get the right, the focus group through WICF. Um, she's, she's been working with that group and um, 
I can we'll have a lot more outreach for the small entities and and a lot more monitoring activities and and Dale I know you you don't want more attention he's told me a lot of times we, we want more attention but not that kind of attention so um yeah but we know there's other tools like outreach that we can use for for reliability and security so we did get a question or two online when renee mentioned peer review for a small entity how can you implement this to meet what WEC auditors would consider is a good process or control thank you see is this on here we go so um in with small entities i think what we're looking for is if you have a uh, a spreadsheet that you're working on, uh, you have a lot of data, uh, particularly with PRC standards where you're doing settings or uh, things like this. Oftentimes, um, you know, having somebody else just take a look at it and um, ensure that the calculations are correct or ensure that the data was input correctly, things weren't transposed. That's what we're talking about for a peer review. Um, I think oftentimes, you know, an engineer is very busy and they've got a lot on their plate, but perhaps there's a technician that could come and also look and, um, you know, just two sets of eyes on, on the data is often an assurance to help uh, ensure that you've, you haven't missed something, even uh, document reviews. Um, I know for myself, when I write a document, I always try and find somebody to reread it because uh, there's often a lot of mistakes get, that can be made. You're busy thinking about what you want to put down there, and sometimes it doesn't always go the way you, you've planned. So um, that would be the type of implementation for a small entity that we would expect to see. Just another set of eyes. That help? Yep. And I, I, are we? Do we have time for one more question? Okay. Go ahead. This is Lenin Maran from Smart. So WCC has talked before about using the work of others. So how can we help you help us? I don't know that. There's so many ways. I think everybody could come up with a different answer of what it is that, that could help us. I, I think a better response, Lennon, would be what can you do or what ideas would you have to help us? I know that's kind of putting the question back to you, but I don't know what tools you have to help us without looking at your tools. Um, so what additional pieces could you feed us what ideas do you have that, that could foster us looking at something? I know the, the ICEMEAD program is definitely there. That's that's one program. I think we'll talk about that later, but. Um, you know, and we discussed this practice guide at the fall workshop in San Diego using the work of others. And I, I think we have an opportunity for kind of where the rubber meets the road to talk about this in the future, either at an open mic or um, at another workshop to just really bring about pertinent examples of, of where that works. It, at the end of the day, it's all about the facts and circumstances for each particular instance, um, but there's certainly opportunity there and we don't wanna pass that up. Another follow-up and you don't have to answer it if you don't have the answer. Sorry, go, uh, uh, go yeah. ahead, Steve. I'm oh, sorry, just real quick in response to Lennon though, I think one of the things we're looking at doing and, and, have, and have done a little bit in the past is that there's a lot of things that you do outside of just your like NERC reliability standard compliance activities that get checked by other internal or external uh, parties within your companies. And so we do try to take account of, of what that looks like. And we're, I think we're trying to, in the future to take even more account in particular where it's internal to your own company, like your own internal audit work and how that can link into our assessment of your controls, for example, because that's uh, that's a control in and of itself, but there might be things that they've done to help provide as recommendations to you that we can further propel into our oversight planning. Uh, and I think we're getting better at that all the time. For third parties and third party assessments and, and third party work that, that occurs, um, you know, there's certainly uh, 
patterns that we've seen with different third party providers. And so we, you know, we, we do naturally take that into account as well that, you know, if somebody's getting advice from X on developing this particular process, we see it be really successful over and over again. That helps us also inform kind of what we do. So it might not be as direct, like we used this work of others or we assessed it this way, uh, but it is something that, that that's part of our thought process. Yeah, thank you. And that partially answers my question, maybe in another future meeting. They, you can talk about how you use this or practical examples of what has been done in the past. Thank you. Thanks, Lennon. Um, that, I've been told, is top of the hour. So we are going to do a quick switch here, but please thank the panel. And I will turn it over to Jimmy to introduce the next topic. Got one? Yeah, that's all me. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. 